Well, let me also say welcome to everybody who's here today. Glad that you have joined us on this day. And as always, now we say hello to our new friends at the Weber County Jail who tune in on Tuesday nights, and we are thrilled that you are part of the Washington Heights family as well. We began a series a couple of weeks ago, and it's entitled, This Is Us. Now, next week, we're going to turn our attention to some Christmas passages, but wanted to take one more week to talk about something with a guy that we have been following for the past couple weeks. His name is Barnabas, and he is an under-the-radar, heavily influential guy in the life of the early church, and the way that he did it was not up front with a lot of fanfare. He did it by living out some principles that express the character and the nature of God. And today we're going to see him have another significant impact on the life of the church 2,000 years ago. And still today, it can help direct people like us. I want to show you something as we get started today. It is one of the face stories of a couple who is a part of Washington Heights. And I want to show you this for a number of different reasons, but primarily... To help us understand right up front, there is nothing like God transforming people's lives by His grace and His power. So check out this video and hear one of those stories. I want to introduce you to um, our friends here, Ray and Melo Vidro. This past year, we went through a lot of turmoil and challenges and... um, the faith we had in God has truly brought us to this point to where literally he's like delivering miracles. Honestly, I mean, if we want to speak transparently, you know, uh, a year ago we were on the brink of divorce. The last year I got into uh, some run businesses and it got to the point that I got really, really depressed. I was totally like, I just don't see the way out. She couldn't see a way out. There was times where I couldn't, <laughs> to be honest with you. But deep down, I'm like, God, I know I don't see it either, but I know you have the way out. I just have to just have faith in you. It's like all the doors got closed on me so I can go to him. I just, I don't know. I just had this faith that I've never had before. Honestly, I've leaned on him and I've never leaned on him the way I've leaned on him this whole year. Sometimes he let you go to the desert to experience all that, to be able to enjoy the promised land. But going through the desert, like my wife said, you know, brought us a lot, lot closer and really almost fell in love with each other all over again. I want to renew my commitment to God and to my wife. I want to celebrate coming together as one. That's beautiful. It's challenging, but now we see the light at the end of the tunnel and uh, our marriage is just getting stronger and stronger every single day. I'll say it again. There is nothing. There is nothing like lives transformed by the grace and the power of God. And people who at some point said yes to following Jesus, and then when they encountered a difficult time, God shows up, and a marriage is saved, and a family is kept together. And who wouldn't want to be a part of that and seeing that happen over and over again? And my guess is that if we took a poll here this morning, everybody would say, well, of course we want to be a part of that. Is there anything that could get in the way of seeing that happen more and more? And I want to suggest to you that the answer to that question is yes. There can be a whole host of things that can get in the way of that. But there's something that we are probably all familiar with and that we all have the opportunity to even participate in that could get in the way of that. And today, as we track along with our guy Barnabas in the life of the early church, you know what we're going to see him do? We're going to see him express something extremely valuable because he's going to put people over preferences. And here's the deal with preferences. Everybody has them about all kinds of things. Have you noticed that people have different preferences when it comes to, oh, say, football teams? Um, You know, the people who love Jesus are cowboy fans, and then there's just everybody else, you know, who (laughs) doesn't, you know, love Jesus enough, and glad we settled that right up front. 
And, you know, we think of, you know, books and movies and music tends to be a big one. And, and I'm going to share something with you about, you know, just my own preference in, in music. How many people here are familiar with my favorite group for about the past 20, 25 years? Um, their name is P.O.D. Has anybody heard of it? Two people. Awesome. That's, that's great. Well, you're going to hear about P.O.D. this morning. Um, let me share with you some lyrics from probably their most famous song. It's called Alive. And it goes like this. starts, every day is a new day. I'm thankful for every breath I take. So I won't take it for granted. So I learn from my mistakes. It's beyond my control. Sometimes it's best to let go whatever happens in this lifetime. So I trust in love. You have given me peace of mind. I feel so alive for the very first time. I can't deny you. Now, come on, that's good, right? <laughs> and if you hear those lyrics, you might say, well, yeah, that's interesting. Never heard of them. Well, let me show you um, a little bit of what POD looks like. And it's these four gentlemen from San Diego who are tatted up and got some metal in them in different places. And I was going to play... I was going to play a clip of that song, but it would kick our people off live stream, unfortunately, because when you play copyrighted stuff, it does that, and there's software that can detect that. But you can go home later, and you can Google the song Alive by P.O.D. P.O.D., by the way, means payable on death, and it is heavy and hard. And I don't know why that style of music speaks to me, but it does. And there was a time in just my journey with God and brand new to being in a relationship with God where that music played a huge role. And in the years when I was running, when I was able to do that, I would listen to a lot of their music. It was very motivating and it just spoke to me. And here is my conclusion, and I think there is a reason that I think that that has such a powerful impact still for me, is that in seasons when God does some great work in us, the things that come along with it, the culture that's around it, maybe music, maybe a particular, you know, program that we were a part of, all kinds of different things were so instrumental in God using that to help us in that journey that to us, to me in that season, it becomes sacred to me. But the mistake that we can make is to think that, hey, you know what? What God did in my life, I want that for everybody. And that's a good desire. But the mistake that we can make is everything that God used in my life is the same thing that he's going to use in everybody else's life, and that's not the way it works. And the important issue is that we would keep the main thing, the main thing, and we're going to find out what that is today. And when it comes to our preferences, we're all entitled to have one, but we put that after people. It's people over preferences. And that's nothing new because right in the early days of the church when it began, that issue popped up. And the thing that can get in the way of people, you know, experiencing, I had a defective finger there for a moment, um, people experiencing, you know, what God has for them is that personal preferences can be valued over people. And when that happens, what God has given us clearly as a target to shoot for gets missed every time. So let's see how it plays out in the life of the early church, and then we're going to see how that relates to people like us here today. So jumping into the book of Acts, meanwhile, the believers who had been scattered during the persecution after Stephen's death traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch of Syria. They preached the word of God, but only to the Jews. Notice that phrase, and let me catch you up here and give you a little bit of context. So Jesus lives, has his three years of public ministry. He dies on a cross to make payment for our sins. He is raised again from the dead three days later. He shows himself to hundreds of people, and his final words to his followers are these, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, teaching them everything that I've taught you and to observe all the things you know that I've taught you. Well, you know, they are following Jesus, but the all the world part and all nations part is not happening because right after all of that and the church begins, everybody is pretty much in a holy huddle in the city of Jerusalem. What changes that is that one of the deacons, a guy named Stephen, gets martyred for his faith. He's put to death because he's a follower of Jesus. 
And all of a sudden, you got people who are saying, yeah, I'll get out of Jerusalem. It doesn't seem that safe here anymore. And all of a sudden, you got them going to all these different places, which was the intention from the very beginning. But you had a group that was only speaking to the Jews. And as we make our way through this passage, think of it this way. This is not an exact comparison, but I think it is a valid one. Whenever you see Jews, think of people who have a church background. They understand what the Bible is. They have spent time with it. They know what it's like to get together and seek to worship God. And then whenever you see either Greeks or Gentiles, think of people who have no church background whatsoever because all of a sudden you're going to have a very different dynamic. If you're coming from a Jewish direction, you have one grid that you're looking through. And if you're coming from a Gentile, non-church background, you've got a very different grid through which you are looking. And that is going to raise some tension because here's what happens next. However, some of the believers who went to Antioch from Cyprus and Cyrene began preaching to the Gentiles, people with no church background, about the Lord Jesus. So they're sharing the Jesus of the Bible with people who had never heard anything about that. The power of the Lord was with them, and a large number of these Gentiles, people with no church background, believed, said yes to Jesus, and they turned to the Lord. When the church of Jerusalem heard what had happened, they sent Barnabas, there's our guy, to Antioch. When he arrived and saw this evidence of God's blessing, he was filled with joy and he encouraged the believers to stay true to the Lord. All of a sudden he shows up and he realizes, well, they're not like us. They're coming from a very different place. But God is obviously doing something here. People are saying yes to Jesus. They are following Jesus and lives are being transformed by the grace and by the power of God. Barnabas was a good man full of the Holy Spirit and strong in faith and many people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. When he found him, he brought him back to Antioch. Both of them stayed there in the church, um, with the church for a full year, teaching large crowds of people. It was at Antioch that the believers were first called Christians. So here's what all of that means. First, there was a holy huddle in Jerusalem. Persecution comes. All of a sudden now, people are moving out, and they're going in places where people have no background whatsoever. Who's the God of the Bible? Never heard of him. But now they're hearing about who Jesus is, why he came, how he lived, how he died, how he rose again from the dead. And, and lives are being changed. They're being transformed. And so Barnabas is sent up there to come alongside some of those people. He reaches out and gets his guy, Paul, um, to come and serve together with him. Saul, Paul, same name. God changes that um, name along the way there. And they spend some time um, with these people who are brand new to what it means to follow Jesus. And then they get sent out to go to some other cities in the Roman Empire to start some new churches there and tell other people who had never heard about who Jesus is, what it means um, to follow him, to give your, your commitment, your, your faith to him. And so the leaders down in Jerusalem say, well, we still got some people up in Antioch, and they need some, you know, more, you know, folks to mentor them, come alongside them. So they send some other leaders up there, and they are steeped in the Jewish tradition and all of the law that came in the Old Testament. And so when they show up in Antioch, they start telling people, hey, you're showing up at the church picnic with a ham sandwich. And that's not a good thing. And if you have no idea what I'm talking about right now, here's what it is. In the Old Testament, it says pork is out. And so they're showing up with a ham sandwich at the church picnic, and people are going, well, how can you do that? And they're like, well, what's the big deal? And also, those teachers who come to Antioch, they not only talk about things like pork, they also say, oh, and in addition to saying yes to Jesus and following after him, you guys, men, are going to have to get circumcised. And they're like, uh, what now? <laughs> yeah, out in the lobby, there's a table, you know, baptism on the one side, circumcision on the other side. Um, <laughs> Pastor Jimmy will get you set up there and um, <laughs> we'll, we'll just get, and they're like, what is going on right now? And the membership class was whittled down to just women. <laughs> But it raises a really, really important question, right? Because if you were coming from that background of the Old Testament, well, you know, I'll, let me give you a chapter and a verse. But they're saying, yeah, but isn't it about Jesus, following Jesus? And the really important question that is raised by all of this 
goes something like this. What all is included in being a follower of Jesus? What does it mean? What do I have to do? And it raises such an important issue, and there is such sharp conflict over this, because when Barnabas and Saul, who have gone on to start other churches and other places, hear what is now being told in Antioch, they say, no, that doesn't, you know, that doesn't just matter in what God is doing. That is not part of the equation there. And if that's what you want to do, that's one thing. And if they want to show up with ham at the, at the potluck, you know, that's okay for them. And if you don't want to, well, then you don't have to. Well, the leadership down in Jerusalem decides, you know what, let's get everybody together and let's talk this issue through. And so they gather together. And it's recorded for us in Acts chapter 15. We're not going to look at all of it today. We're going to just jump into a couple passages here as the leadership, some of whom walked with Jesus for those three years, are going to weigh in on what does it mean because we have two different groups coming together in this thing called the church, and what does it mean to follow Jesus? What is included Peter is the first guy um, who speaks in that, and here in Acts chapter 15, verse 9, he's talking about Jesus, and Peter says, He, Jesus, made no distinction between us and them, for He cleansed their hearts through faith. And he's talking about all these people who have no religious, no, in our context, church background, who have said yes to Jesus and begun following Him. And there's a really important thing here. Because if we lean in the religious direction and you kind of grew up in that setting and, you know, that's where I grew up too. And we might lean in that direction. We might say, you know what, God likes us a little bit more because we've kind of, you know, maybe put in some time and shown some effort. You're wrong. God doesn't love you more. But if you lean in the other direction, you say, yeah, you know what, some of them seem really bound up in a lot of the things that come along with that, and there needs to be more, you know, freedom on the other side, and we who have no background with that understand more of what that's like, and so God must love us a little bit more. You're wrong. What Peter says is he made no distinction. In other words, it doesn't matter who you are. God loves you. We sang these words just a few moments ago, the light of the world given for us. Well, who's the us? We might think, well, us who gather together like this. Nope. When Jesus' birth was announced, it says, and his coming is good news, a great joy for all the people, no matter who you are. Does God love people who have tattoos all the way up their arms? Yep. Does God love people who have metal in their face and other parts of their body? Yep. God love people who don't have any of that? Yep. He makes no distinction because it isn't about that. And Peter, who could have so easily leaned in that direction because that was his background as well, says, hey, look, we got to recognize what God is doing. All these people who have never done any of the things that we have done in our effort to make ourselves right with God and everything since, he's made no distinction. And he goes on, and these are Peter's words as well. So why are you now challenging God by burdening the Gentile believers, these people with no background, with a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors were able to bear? Hey, look, we all know that all the rules and regulations that are there in the Old Testament, we couldn't do it. Why are we now going to place that on them? And it was a whole bunch of things that were part of a civil nation in the Old Testament, but God has now gone global to all nations. So those were for a time and a place. There was a whole bunch of ceremonial stuff that God asked people to participate in. New Testament tells us Jesus is the fulfillment of all of that. The part that is repeated in the New Testament is the moral part, the way that we're called to behave as an expression of the character and the nature of God. So it doesn't mean anything goes. But Peter says, hey, look, we couldn't do all that stuff. Why would we put that on them? We believe that we are all saved the same way by the undeserved grace of the Lord Jesus. And I don't know how you could say it any clearer than that. He says, that's the main thing. 
that there are people coming from a very different place. And how are they being made right with a holy God the same way anybody else is? By the grace of God alone, through faith alone, in the Jesus of the Bible alone. That's it. That's the main thing. Well, the half-brother of Jesus, his name is John, gets up at the end of this. Uh, his name is James. He's the half-brother of Jesus. Gets up at the end of this conversation. He says, and so my judgment is that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. And I think it's easy for us here 2,000 years ago to say, yeah, they were, you know, struggling with those kind of issues. But, you know, while the issues may have changed, the principles and the struggle with it can still remain. I want to give you one example of this that I think is a little bit more current. It comes from a time when I was still in school and I was doing a couple years as a youth pastor as an intern. And during those two years, you know, a number of great things happened. It was also during those two years I knew that my future was not being a youth pastor. And so um, that was clear. But there were some great things that happened. And one time we were planning this event, and it was an event where the kids who were part of our program on a regular basis could invite their friends who maybe weren't. And, you know, maybe they were from a church background, maybe they weren't. And one of the kids took that risk, and it's a risk, especially at that interesting time of life, to invite one of your friends to come to church with you. It's also scary for somebody to walk through the doors in that place in life. And sure enough, here comes this guy and his friend, and we're walking down a hallway in the church and coming the other way with somebody who was a part of the church, not part of the whole youth thing that we were doing. And this guy had on a hoodie and jeans and a baseball cap. And as we were passing, we never even stopped. It was just kind of continuous motion. And the guy pointed over at the friend and he said, hey, no hats in church, take it off. And I don't know if you've ever had that moment when you look at somebody and you realize, ooh, that was not good. And that guy stayed the rest of that event. I never saw him again. And I think inside of ourselves, we go, what's the big deal with hats? Best case scenario, you know, I think if somebody inside of themselves says, hey, it's a good thing to honor God and respect God. And so we want to do our best for God. And you know what? That's all good. But sometimes what we do is we mistakenly take what it's really about for some other imitation version of that. Well, we think that respecting God is either not having a hat on or dressing a certain way or something that is about the outside rather than what God wants to do inside of somebody. And 2,000 years ago, in its first and early days, a group of leaders got together who could have so easily leaned in that direction. That's right. Hats are out, and hoodies are out, and jeans are out, and sneakers are out, and tattoos are out, and all the... And they said, hey, 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 it isn't about that. It really is about Jesus, about people meeting and following Jesus. How does that happen? By the grace of God, through faith in God, in the Jesus of the Bible. So what does that mean for people like us? Let me share with you a couple ways to think about this and apply it. First thing, where God is working, lives are changing. Right, Barnabas shows up at a place where he's probably not bringing ham to the church potluck, but it's probably okay for them because people are saying yes to Jesus, and lives are being changed, they're being transformed. And that truly is what it's about. Now, we might say, but hey, look, there's some things in this culture of ours that are not all that great. And you know what? I completely agree with you. So how do we filter that? How do we understand that? Let me give you one suggestion. Three things to start with are, you can do one of three things. You can receive it, you can reject it, or you can redeem it. What does receive it mean? Well, there are some things that are neutral, and you can receive those. If I gave you a sheet of music and just had notes on it, no lyrics on it or anything, you wouldn't be able to tell, you know, who wrote that and for, for what purpose. It's just neutral. 
And so you can receive that. And music, in all honesty, is just about preference over styles. But there are also a lot of things in our culture that are not all that great, are they? And those are things we need to reject every time. Things that lean into racism and sexism and violence and just disrespect and disregard for people or, you know, the things of God. Um, just don't receive that. Well, what does it mean to redeem something? That's when we can take something from our culture and we can put it in the context where it points to Jesus or helps others to understand who Jesus is. Let me give an example of that. Does the name Martin Luther mean anything to anybody? He was a guy who was part of what is called the Protestant Reformation. And there was a time where a lot of the essentials of what it really is about, it's about Jesus and coming to know him and being in a relationship with him. And a lot of that got obscured. And so these reformers said, let's get back to what it's really all about, grace through faith in Jesus of the Bible alone. Well, along with that came a whole bunch of music. And so you know what Martin Luther did? He took some German beer hall tunes, and he put some lyrics to them. And my guess is that if you come from a church background like I do, you may know his songs. And I'm going to sing like the first line of one of his. Are you excited about that? <laughs> yeah, because you know it's not my gift, and so you know I'm going to make a fool of myself. But as you hear this, I think you can even say, yeah, you know what? That sounds like German beer hall music right there. This is what he wrote. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Hey! <laughs> and you can hear how... Thank you. <laughs> it's always good when your mom's present and accounted for. <laughs> but you can kind of hear where that comes from, right? And, and here was somebody who took some music and put it in a different context, and all of a sudden, it's helping us understand who God is. And that is redeeming something. Let me go back to my POD example with their heavy and hard music. And we think, you know, why even do that? I heard them once in an interview, and they said this. You know, we come from the inner city. And there is a predominant music style that kids in the inner city listen to. And it is dark, and it is without hope, and it is violent. And so what they did is they wanted to give those kids in that environment their music with a different message. So I believe in love. You have given me hope. I can't deny you. It's like they're music missionaries to the inner city. And so when it comes to understanding this principle here, we might, you know, say, hey, look, we all got different preferences, but when we see that lives are being transformed by the grace and the power of God, we have every right to say, you know what, that's not my thing, it's not my preference, but man, am I glad that it's there. Because people matter. Which people? All people. Here's what was said in that meeting. When he arrived and saw this evidence, this is Barnabas, of God's blessing, he was filled with joy and he encouraged the believers to stay true to the Lord. Hey, they're not like us, but you know what it isn't about that. It is about Jesus. The main thing is our people meeting and following Jesus. If we were to go to another country, and our goal was to share who Jesus is and how anybody can have a relationship with him. Could you imagine going there and saying, okay, before we do, you know, anything along those lines, you all need to learn my language, English. You all need to cheer for my team, the Cowboys. You all need to become like me before we ever get to Jesus. Or would it be the other way around where we would say, you know what, I need to learn their language and I have the opportunity to share the Jesus of the Bible in ways that make sense in that culture. And think about how culture shifts and changes, and there are times, you know, culture wears me out and brings me down. But you know what? There is a message of hope 
that needs to be put into every context because every body matters. He's the light of the world given for us, all of us. Another principle along these lines, be more concerned with what God wants than what you prefer. And boy, is it easy to lean in the direction of the things that we like. And it's a free country and everybody's entitled to a preference. That's great. But when you think about Jesus, you know, he left heaven. And I'm just a little bit of assumption here, but I think that you would agree with me that he would have rather preferred to stay in heaven, which is absolute perfection with perfect community throughout all eternity. But he came here instead. He was born in a stable, and he did it for you and me. And so when it comes to things like music, I listen to my POD on my own time. And why do we do the things that we do here on a Sunday? And I'm not making any claims to having this all figured out perfectly, but we are taking aim at doing what is going to reach the most people possible for Jesus. It's as simple as that. But it's so easy for us to think, well, you know, I like this, so why don't we do what I like? May we put people ahead of our own preferences so you ask, well, are we going to do POD sometime because you like them? I'd like that, but we're not going to. You know why? Because I don't think it takes aim at the biggest segment of our culture. And that's what we're going to do. Here's what was said in that meeting. We believe that we're all saved by the same way, by the undeserved grace of the Lord Jesus. That's what it's about. And the different forms and fashions that come with that, they ebb and flow, but they are not what it's really all about, which really leads into um, the third principle, which is God's purposes prevail, but human preferences pass away. You know, before Martin Luther showed up and some other guys like him, most messages in churches were given in Latin. And so if you knew Latin, that was great. If you didn't know Latin, oh well. All of a sudden, some people came along and said, hey, why don't we just speak in the language of the people who are there? And some people freaked out. No, we can't do that. But they did it. There was a time before Martin Luther came along where Bibles were not in the hands of every person. They were chained to a pulpit. Now, we don't have a pulpit, but imagine it chained to a table. And you had to come to receive anything from it. And people like Martin Luther showed up and they said, hey, let's take the printing press, some brand new technology of the day, and let's get those Bibles out there in the hands of everybody. And people freaked out. And Martin Luther took beer hall tunes and put new words to them. And it was a new form of music. And people freaked out. And it seems like that dynamic plays out over and over again. But it really is about the main thing. People meeting and following Jesus. Grace alone, through faith alone, in the Jesus of the Bible alone. And it doesn't matter who you are, where you're from, what you've done or what's been done to you. God loves you. And that's why Peter said he made no distinction between us and them. For he cleansed their hearts through faith. That's how it happens. So who are we? What are we all about? And what has fueled this time where we seek to just bless the community beyond ourselves and, but really informs us just on a regular basis of making the decisions that we do and charting the direction that we have? This is us. We put people over personal preferences. And we all got preferences, and that's fine. That's great. But you know what God has called us to be unified around is the value of people above the things that we like. Because God is seeking to help as many people as possible meet and follow Jesus. Would you bow your heads together with me as I pray? And just before I do, I wonder if you've never taken that step of faith and trust and relationship with God, you can do that. And realize just up front, God loves you just the way you are. 
He knows all about us, even the things maybe that we would like to tuck away or to hide or to ignore. He knows that, and he loves you. And you can ask him to forgive you, and he will make you right with a holy God by his grace and his power. And you commit yourself to following after him. That's the main thing. And you get to experience life inside of a relationship with the living God. He wants to lead you somewhere good. Lord Jesus, thank you for the many, many ways that you are good and gracious to us. And thank you for the opportunities that we have to respond to that, to show your love in practical ways. So God, during this Project Share season, may that be what is seen that anything that is done in your name would truly be about you, the character and the nature that we have received, that we enjoy, that we want to pass along to be a conduit to our community. And we ask you, God, that it would bring honor and glory to you and to your name alone. And so we ask and pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.